You're listening to the Ant Pod Care Guide Edition. Your host, Ant Holifer. Thank you for the introduction, Lexi, and hello and welcome back to the Antpod Care Guide Edition. Today we are talking about Care Bear Diversa, and before I start, I want to say that this podcast can also be heard as an audio only. Link will be shown in the description. Today, in the panel, we have Anne's Hood, Sid from Makushi, and finally Jake from Antimatters as the panelists. Hood is known for his YouTube channel, where he makes videos on his multiple different ant colonies. And can we get an hello, Hood? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Anne's Hood, just so you know what my voice sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Next to Hood, we have Sid, who is known for having the company Wakushi, which is a specialized and selling product company. Say hello, Sid. Hello, guys. Hello to you, Sid. And lastly, we have our regular pod host, Jake, who is known for his YouTube channel, where he weekly recaps what have happened in the ant community, while also documenting some of his own ants. Say hello, Jake. Hello, everyone. Hello to you, Jake. And... So, of course, these guys are not chosen at random. No, all of our panelists today have a very strong, or at least had some strong, Carabara diverse colonies. And uh, before we start, I want to hear a little bit about your colonies before we get into the care guide itself. So, Hood, what is your experience with Carabara Diversa? Um, I've um, had mine for just over a year, and to tell you the truth, at the moment, they're being quite manageable. Um, I've learned my experiences from my Solenopsis where they grew too quickly for me. And these guys are making sure that I've got plenty of uh, outworld space and plenty of nest space for them. So, yeah, at the moment it's been enjoyable, but I do know the reputation of these ants uh, with their wanting to escape and being very escape, uh, escape pro, shall we say. So I'm mindful. But at the moment, it's been a good experience for me. And uh, how many times have you tried keeping the species? This is my second attempt to actually keep the species. My first attempt failed miserably because uh, they arrived with mites and I put them in a naturalistic setup. And then once they, the mites got into that high humidity environment with natural soils, they just decimated my Connolly. Yeah, I've, had, I've dealt with mites with Carabara diversa. It's not so good. Um, but, how is big, but how big is your colony today? Well, this is up for debate because I am notoriously bad estimating numbers which obviously Sid can uh, testify because he got my uh, Solenopsis Connolly when I estimated the whole Connolly to be around 50,000 he told me there was about 50,000 in the nests I sent him and there was a good tw- uh, <laughs> good cu- couple of tens of thousands that were still in the outworld uh, when I sent it off but I would guess that this Connolly initially I guessed at 5,000 in my next video but people have said no it's about double that so I'm going to say around tw- uh, 10,000 now and what kind of setup do they live in then? Mine are in a artificial setup. Controversial for this species because I know the common consensus with them is they've got to be a naturalistic. But because of my YouTube channel and wanting to film them, and not only that though, I wanted to make it more uh, to prove that they could be more accessible for everybody out there because not everyone's got a space for a naturalistic setup or can look after that per se. So I wanted to try it in a artificial setup. And to tell you the truth. 10,000 in just over a year, I think I've pulled it out of the bag. Definitely, it is not a bad story. Jake, you are also a keeper of Carabara Diversa. What is your experience with the species? Well, I'm keeping my girls. I've gone the traditional way and headed in the natural direction. So they're in a nice uh, big tank. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. They've got plenty of soil, plenty of plants. Um, I'm quite surprised they still have some plants because they're nine months old now and I expected them to turn over all the plants in no time at all. However, they've been quite respectful and I think they're about half the size of hoods. But yeah, they're getting along quite well. Yeah, I want to say to be continued regarding the plants because I've heard that the plants do not stand a chance once the colony grows big enough. But how many times have you tried keeping this species? Uh, this is my second attempt as well. Basically, I had pretty much the same story as Hood had. Although my queen, she came with mites and I didn't even end up taking her out the tube in the end. Like, And I did actually manage to get rid of the mites, but it was too late and she collapsed. <laughs> oh, yeah. So for all those listening, listening out there, if you're just getting a Carabara queen, make sure to check for mites. We have had two for two so far with uh, casualties. So, yeah, check. be aware of that. And Jake, how big do you reckon the colony is today? You said half the size of food, but... 
yeah, yeah maybe five thousand, I'd say. So I think Hoods is at least ten thousand. And uh, once again, what setup did they live in? A naturalistic tank, yeah, about one hundred and twenty liters. And what kind of is it? Just regular dirt or any special dirt mix? Well, I mostly use ant ants, oh, not ant ant, um, antscapes or Ryan. He has a tropical mix in his shop, so I use that mostly. And I kind of mix in a lot of rocks as well because I found the Carabera, they do like to nest under rocks. So if you chuck a few large rocks in there as well, they do appreciate it. All right. Lastly, we have Sid. As, uh, lastly, we also have Sid here. And uh, Sid, what is your experience with this species? So uh, I had a colony of these probably approaching maybe a year and a half, two years ago. And um, <clears throat> I think I got them to probably close to what Hood's colony is like now um, in regards to size, maybe not quite just as big as that, um, because I was starting to protein control them uh, when they got to a certain size. Um, but from memory, they were spreading across three nests in an outworld. Um, but um, unfortunately, during some product testing, um which will probably uh, you can explain a little bit later um but the in entire colony was lost uh, as a result of uh, some testing but y yeah so i had them for a, probably about seven months i would say um and that was from uh queen and a few workers um yeah up to around about eight eight ten eight to ten thousand workers in seven months so yeah they're they're very fast growing um but that's yeah that's the experience i had with them and is it the, was the first time you kept them, or have you tried before? Well, that particular colony, um, <clears throat> it's it's a hard one to say because obviously, um, being being a store having um, multiple ones passing through, the reason that 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 queen actually was kept is because um, in quarantine she was found with mites. Um, so I just thought, well, what I'll do, I'll try and keep her as a personal colony, and just see how it panned out. And luckily. Um, I think originally she had uh, maybe 50 workers and, and there was a bunch of mites on them and things and the queen had uh, a few mites on her and um, over sort of some time um, while they were in the nest they the, the workers just died with the mites and thankfully they kind of the mites also died out and eventually you know over the course of a sort of few weeks um, the, the mite infestation cleared itself up so uh yeah and then she just went on to flourish yeah i must say i'm very impressed for how many mites attacks we've had so i've also kept the uh, care bear diversa <clears throat> but i lost my colony due to mites so that is four for four with mites problems so yeah definitely something to look very closely at when you get your colony to see if they have any mites that has been a little bit of an introduction to all of the panelists and we'll now move into the general and facts about carabara diversa so the first question is where are they found and where are they considered native and carabara diversa are native to asia although when i did a little bit of research they were also somehow in australia which i didn't quite understand but it must be another marauder ant species since google said both things um, but yeah, they are considered native in Asia, and that is most of the countries around that area. And the temperature, I don't know if you have anything, if you guys have heard anything about this, where they live. Well, I've heard that the temperature, um, and a lot of the care guides say temperature is quite high, around 28 degrees, if memory serves. I'm not doing that at the moment. Um, I'm not sure what the other chaps kept theirs at. Um, I'm keeping mine at 25 degrees, and... Initially, I, I expected when they found when they found it that they would grow uh, quicker than they did. But as you can tell, recently in the past couple of months, they've exploded. So I, I think where I'm keeping them at 25 is good and is 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 not running the risk of cooking them. Uh, more importantly, and what kind of humidity would you guess you are having? No idea. Um, I'm <laughs> keeping them in the. They do like humidity. They like it uh, quite high anyway. Uh, hence why I'm using, um, I'm not doing this because Wakushi's here, I'm not a Wakushi fanboy as it were, but um, his MS series are really good at holding on to the humidity um, and I'm keeping them in there and I'm watering it maybe once a week 
just to keep the humidity topped up. And it seems to be working, as you can see from my videos, my Conley's doing really well. So they do like high humidity. Uh, what it actually is, I don't generally keep track of that. I just trust the nests that I've got them in. Yeah, I must say, the more experience I've got, I've started to also just trust the nest a lot more than looking at the numbers. Jake, what temperature are you keeping your colony at? Well, it's kind of hard to tell, to be honest. I've got, basically at the minute, um, two large heat mats under the whole tank. But the kind of the top temperature can vary. Some days it's as low as like nine degrees and other wow. days it's up to 25 but I do think they just kind of sit in at the bottom of the tank when it is cold. And because I'm guessing it's still kind of quite warm down there, but mostly they just manage it themselves, to be honest. But when it is that cold, I won't see them in the outworld. They all hide away deep down uh, underground. So is there a sweet spot for when they're the most active or is it just the hotter it is, the oh. more active they get? Well, I think anything past about 21 degrees and they start to start kicking off then yeah and then it kind of goes up and up and up and i'd say anything past about 26 it's kind of peak kind of everything like activity if you get what i mean yeah and uh, what about humidity of course it's quite hard to ask that when you have a naturalistic setup but how often are you watering the setup it depends to be honest they've had quite a, a rough little life in their tank because at one point i had a water feature and basically managed to fill the whole tank with about two inches of water at least uh -huh. and the soil is only maybe about three inches high so everything in there was completely saturated and yeah they did absolutely fine through that all the plants died everything else died but the carabera kind of managed to hold on and then i didn't water it then for it was about two or three months maybe and yeah they didn't seem to mind at all as well i kind of dried it completely out and but they've kept plowing on just fine. Did you then give them a water source in that kind of drought? Um, semi, but they don't. They didn't really seem to kind of take it that much. Then they never seemed too interested in their water sources. That's that's interesting. I mean, yeah, it's of course when you're drying your ants out, it's very important to give them a water source so they can do something. Sid, what kind of temperature have you kept your colony at? Um, so when I had them, they're in, so all the, all the personal colonies are in a heated room and that typically varies depending on summer and winter. And it would probably range anything from around about 20 to 27, but I'd say typically it hangs mostly around 23, 24, 25, you know, depending on the time of day, that's typically the, the sort of most of temperatures uh, the, the most likely temperatures that, that they were hanging around at. So, um, you know, I think 24 and the growth rate was, um, was very, very good on that. So, you know, I would probably say, uh, you know, with the fact that looking at hoods growth, um, my growth was about the same that really sort of an ambient temperature of around about, um, <clears throat> around 24, 25, uh, is probably the ideal peak environment. Um, yeah, I suppose that would be what I would say. And what about humidity there? Did you have any triggers or was it just like, no, hydration? well, it's just the same as hood really. It was just a, it was just a, you know, a hydration top up. Um, I didn't use any, I didn't use any liquid feeders or anything in, in the setups. There was literally nothing at all. The only, the only water source they had would have been drinking from the, the gypsum when it was hydrated. Um, so you know the um the so the setup i used was literally mirroring uh hoods hood setup where it was the two of the five five ms five five um units and but i originally started them in, a, in an ms three five um and then just kind of you know added a new nest on each time so you sort of, it seemed like when they were getting the first few months they filled out the little first um the first nest and then after that it was nearly adding a new nest every month uh, with the rate of growth. So, um, but yeah, no, so it was, uh, it's very much, my setup was very much like Hood's is now. All right. So next question is, do they hibernate? And as far as I've researched, they don't hibernate. I know that there's a few Asian species like Campanotus nicorensis that may slow down 
and go into somewhat of a diapose during winter. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I have not seen any people say that they directly need to hibernate. I don't know if you guys have heard anything about that. No, um, it's not something I've experienced with mine either. Uh, in the year that I've had them, I got them last November, had them through the summer, and I've obviously got them now, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dave, I've not noticed any drop-off in brood production or anything like that, so I've not noticed any kind of day pause at all or anything like that. All right. What about red yeah. darkness? Um, what about keeping them in the dark? Um, of course, some species can be very light tolerant and other species don't care at all. Uh, Sid, did you keep your colony in the dark or in the red light or just out in the open? Um, right. So, well, this is a this is a bit of a sensitive topic for me because I'm 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 a firm believer of um, ants will be ants will get used to lighting. So, um, you know, in testing I've done with black light, red light, and no shield, the results I got were all the same. So <laughs> I've kind of just, you know, it's it was some of the testing I did with the Saturns to determine whether or not they, they needed to have some, you know, was it quite important? And I tested it with some very light, scent or you know, mythically light-sensitive species, you know, things like Mesa, where a lot of people say that they need to be kept in the dark. Um and uh, it turns out, you know, a lot of people were kind of, well, this is just from, from my opinion anyway, um, that I think a lot of the times people think that they might be light sensitive is because when they lift the lid, people think that they're they're freaking out and scattering because they're, they're sensitive to the light, when in theory, which in fact, it's actually the vibrations of removing the lid is what sets them off. Um, is I, I ran the test of... Um, basically keeping a you know having a them in a dark room and then flat turning on a bright light right in front of them and the colony doesn't doesn't flinch but yeah the second think... that the yeah, setup is touched they they freak out so um you know i think that so you know my answer when it comes to red light no light my answer will always be the same of really you know that being said i did have a red shield on mine uh, purely because they, they, they had them in there. And I don't think that ants um, prefer having no light, um, having a, a lid off, but uh, I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference to uh, colonies' growth. I think they just get used to it. But, um, you know, I did use a red shield with those um, at the time. I think there's some merit to that as well. Um, I, I think just about every ant keeper has noticed that at periods of time, ants in artificial setups will move brood into the outworld. I mean, I'm looking at my meat ants now and I've got a load of brood in the outworld, which is obviously exposed to light. And it's been like that for a little while now. Uh, I think in, it, it's, it's not observed in nature very often, uh, but I think it's more in this, in fact, at all. They've very, they, I've never, ever seen an ant colony put larvae, pupae, anything like that outside of their nest for any reason. So I do, I understand what Wakushi is saying that, um, yeah, light might not be a biggest factor as what people may think. I think it's quite evident with his satin nests that he's got out that have no light shielding at all that ants still do fine in there. Personally, I still prefer to keep mine under a red filter. Uh, call me traditionalist, if you wish. Uh, but And my mess is I prefer to keep in a blackout nest as well. But like I said, that's probably me being more traditionalist than it is anything else. So yeah, I think you, I, so. Have 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 you kept your carabera in the red then? Yeah, my carabera, uh, carabera, I've kept in a red filter, and I've got no intentions to change that. To be honest, because yeah, I've got no intentions to change it. I'll probably keep them like that. I mean, I can respect that. And I can also say that for all who's interested in, in hearing a little bit more of our thoughts or the ant pod, the regular crew, um, you can hear part 30, which is all about the best conditions to keep, uh, keep, uh, keep ants in, where we also go over this topic of light slash vibration. Um, the Carabara Diversa have nuptial flights only in April, which I found a little bit weird, um, but that may be also just where they have been observed to fly, at least on the website I've looked on. Uh, but they do have the nuptial flights kind of early year. But also, as it is an Asian species, they may just fly a little bit all year long. But as far as I can see online, they only fly in April, which I find a little bit hard to believe. And the last general question is, do the ants stink or spray acid? And 
no, the ants do neither spray uh, acid or sting. The thing that can make them a little bit unkit safe is due to the, them having quite big majors, or at least super majors, when the colony is a little bit older. But again, if you just don't let your kids put your hands in there, um, I would consider the species kit safe. What do you guys think, Sid? Would you say if this is a kid safe species? Um, I wouldn't recommend them for kids purely because of the growth. Um, the fact that if they do grow large and they escape, um, they they are they're marauder ants. They they will they will they will hunt down other colonies. Um, you know they will wipe them out. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend I wouldn't recommend them as kid safe and. Um, Due to the nature of their numbers, they're very swarmy, and uh, and if you are putting hands in, even even just ignoring the majors, the f- even though the actual workers are so tiny, now they're really really small ants, and um, they're really thin ants as well, so they're they're not sort of chunky, but but they have a hell of a bite. You know, uh, getting bitten by one of them feels much the same uh as as really a meat ant in a lot of ways so they they've got a real strong jaw about them even the little workers so uh if you get quite a lot of them on your hand it can be quite sort of it can be a little bit not painful but for a kid it could be um so i i wouldn't recommend them just because of the cost of the setups if you are keeping them in um artificial uh, they need a lot of expansion if you're keeping them in natural their growth rates become very challenging to deal with. They're very challenging to move. So I would say that these are definitely expert level adult keeper ants. And this is why we have the panel because, yeah, it's always good to have a little bit of information. Once you have seen a big colony, you respect the big colony a lot more than when you just have a small colony. Uh, do you guys have anything to add? I, would you also, are you agreeing with Sid or? Yeah, yeah, I'd one hundred percent agree with what Sid said. Like, I don't think a, a kid they definitely not match up well, just because <laughs> they grow so fast. And to be able to afford them, you, yeah, you just can't really do that as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> they're also very, very sensitive. I mean, not saying that you know kids couldn't keep um, sensitive ants, but they're they're very challenging to raise. They're not they're not uh, they're not easy during the founding stages. Um, they they have a, a very high mortality rate. They have a v- extremely, if not the highest rate of mite infestation uh, infestations that you know suppliers will will get because naturally in the wild, um, you know, there's a lot of different theories and, and stuff. But um, you know where they where they can they may be the type of ants that have to regularly relocate to avoid. Uh, my egg infestations hatching so they keep you know um you know moving nests and things like that so um yeah there's um but but i've never known any ant uh have be more uh infected with air uh, with mites than uh, than diversa so that's that's another factor as well they're, they're very sensitive very uh very hard to raise and um yeah have a very high risk of of mites uh in general yeah, I think it's quite evident with uh, all three of us, four of us, sorry, have kept carabaras and all of us have experienced mites. Yeah. Uh, it, is very, it is a very common issue. Um, and they are quite a mobile ant in the wild. And like uh, Sid alluded to, it could be because they're moving away to get away from mite infestations. A lot of people say it's because they're dirty, messy ants um, and they keep dirty nests and stuff. But from my observations from my ones when the nest was too big yes they did put rubbish in that but when they needed to expand and get bigger they moved it out into the out world yeah. so uh, and the nest that i've got now there is quite a bit of space in there at the moment because i recently put an expansion on with another uh, ms 5.5 but they're not filling that full of rubbish so i think that hypothesis that they're messy in their nests is not a true reflection um when it comes to the setups and and if they're kid friendly as well I've got very much share the opinion of um, Jake and um, Wakushi uh, on this, that they're not kid-friendly. The bites don't, as Sid alluded to, the, the, the miners um, don't overly hurt, but when you've got a lot of them on you, as I did in my last video, for example, it does become kind of painful and uncomfortable. 
I've not been bitten by a super major yet or a larger one, uh, one of the larger um, majors yet, but I imagine that they've got quite strong jaws compared to if the small ones hurt that much. And like people said, it's the expansion of them as well, the the growth rate you have to keep up with. They're, they're not a cheap species. I think they average around 60, 70 pounds to buy with a queen and a, a load of workers. But it's the you need good quality outworlds and good quality nests to keep them contained. And with their growth rate, the money starts mounting up. I've got three nests and I've got one, two, three, four outworlds attached to them at the moment with a lot of tubing to um, expand, as it were, to make the illusion that they've got a lot more space than they actually have with the extra tubing that I've got. Um, and I think any any kid that might be buying ants products with their pocket monies or something like that that hasn't got a slush fund of money to support these ants they will struggle and then they might come on, come a cropper because as Lid, uh, Sid alluded to, they are aggressive ants and they will actively hunt out other colonies and destroy them. And I've known a couple of people tell me that's happened to them when they've kept them. This is why I'm trying to keep on top of their expansion by giving them loads of outworlds and stuff to stop that need to try and get out and find more food. Right. This was a lot more inside knowledge than I expected. And I just want to say thank you to all four. Um, Sid, you're the only one who has had a mite infestation and survived. Did you have? Do you have any tips for how to deal with the mites? Um, well, in that scenario, the it was just really a case of I I have a belief that they uh, there wasn't too many of them. Um, it wasn't a massive infestation, um, but I definitely saw some of the workers on there. And I think pretty much what happened was. Uh, they think they had around about 50 workers and then uh it seemed like over the course of around a week this obviously was a long time ago so i'm just trying to remember it but it i, I remember them dying back down to about 10 workers and it was and i think that the 10 workers kind of removed the um the workers that had mites on them and i remember when it went down to about 10 workers they didn't really see any mites anymore and i think that the because they were in a very uh, very artificial setup there was no uh soil or, or any substrate for eggs to be laid on there was no uh there was no sort of trash waste or anything by them because i'd been very um i didn't even have a, an outworld connected at this time so the the way in which i raised them was just having a, a an ms35 nest with a i think it was about five centimeters of tube um connected to it with uh, just plugged with some uh, some um cotton wool and they used to just bring their trash to the end of the uh the tube and i used to feed them you know heart like a chopped half mealworm through the end of the tube and then the workers would drag the you know the um the, the food in and then they would put the trash back at the end of that tube so um i think just as a result of the mites not having an opportunity to breed or lay any eggs i think they eventually just died out um and uh, and then just going forward i think that was pretty much the case so i think that s with mites and substrate it becomes very difficult because they ha the, the mites have that breeding ground um and the, the majority of mites will have they have a kind of egg cycle uh, and i'm not too sure the time frame but i imagine it's probably like most which are usually around about 28 days so um it's why you can you can sometimes notice uh, like with grain mites um, if you regularly clean out worlds, you don't notice them. But when if if a trash pile has been in there and it's it's you know got damp you know sort of decaying food, mites can start to breed and they usually boom out of it in massive numbers after about um, sort of three four weeks or so. Um, but yeah, so you know in that scenario, I just think that the the mites just died out through a lack of opportunity of being able to breed, um, and thankfully they weren't in big numbers. So yeah. That was that was pretty much the experience in in that regards, but I didn't didn't use any high priced smiles or anything like that at the time, um, because to be honest, I I didn't really have much hope for the queen because I'd not really heard many scenarios where they, if they've got mites they can kind of recover from it, uh, but in that scenario um, they did, and I actually had another colony of um, a finis Carrera uh, the finis uh, two queen which also had mites did the same setup. And it was an exact repeat of the same scenario. So they also uh, recovered from mites um, doing the same thing. That colony was then actually sold because it was, I didn't need both of them. Yeah. So what are, we have, of course, also done a mite episode a while back. I can't remember the exact number, but we've also done a discussion about that. 
Um, the, the, the most common way is lemon, although lemon is something I personally wouldn't recommend because I've heard just as much bad as good. But generally what I've also gotten the feel of after having my mic problem is if, as long as you just keep up on removing the food, um, you should have a good chance of fighting against the mites or using uh, mite kill mites such as hypernastic miles. I want to say thank you um, to the Wild Martin for letting us use some of his thumbnail pictures. So if you like the picture you clicked on to hear this podcast, uh, all credit goes to the Wild Martin. So thank you very much. And with that, it's now ja time to hear all of the very juicy parts. What are the secrets to how your colonies have grown? How much do you feed them? It's time to go into the species-specific questions. And Hood, you are currently muted, but... What is the best way to found the species and grow them large? Well, I think they're very quite, they are quite protein hungry. The queen produces a lot of eggs in a very quite a short period of time. Um, so for me, it's making sure if you want a big Connolly, plenty of protein for them. Uh, there is it's a good way of controlling it, as Sid alluded to earlier. It's a good way of controlling it by controlling the amount of protein you give them. But feed them a lot. Uh, they do like their, their sweet stuff. Um, but I would recommend that if you do that, that you give them honey, honey pots, not honey pots, sorry, jelly pots, because I've used the liquid feeders on them. And every time they just put rubbish in it, which breaks the seal. So it leaks everywhere. and It's very messy and very sticky. So I would use jelly pots as well. That's a top tip from me, to be fair. And how did you found them from from the test tube? Did you move them into a... I must say, Sid, I have not heard the way of founding before was using a nest and just using a tube as an outworld, but Hood, um, how did you go? What is your history of how they ended up like they are today? I The test tube that they were in, they started to run out of water, so I made the decision to move them into an MS 3.5. At the time, they only occupied about a third of that nest, and because I was expecting quite a big growth, I didn't think it was a massive issue. Uh, and like I said before, they did then move um, rubbish into it. But as they got bigger, they moved that rubbish back out again. So, yeah, I, I, I did normally that I'd be more comfortable with. I did move them quite quickly into a, to the uh, because of the test tube situation into a nest. But as you can see with my Conley now, it wasn't detrimental to them and they, they, they've done fine with it. All right. Jake, you have a naturalistic setup. Did you just move them straight into a naturalistic setup when you got them? Or what is your history from start to now? Well, I think I got my queen in maybe March. Although beforehand, I think she was a 2021 queen. She must have been, well, maybe from April 2021. And, but I got her about 100, 150 workers from uh ant antics so they'd obviously nurtured her on quite well and she was just in a test tube but it seemed to be doing her well and yeah i had absolutely like no problems with her in the test tube for a few weeks and then i just put her straight into the uh big naturalistic tank pretty much i just gave i got a pencil jabbed a little hole in it just as a pilot hole and they ended up going straight down it and yeah that's the that's it <laughs> So did, it was just a massive, massive gal, uh, massive naturalistic setup, or did you upgrade over time? Well, I started with a small triangular like pot, and I had the other tank ready to go, but I thought, no, I'll keep them in the little pot for a bit, just because they're small still. And that worked out good, and then eventually they did start kind of pushing the limits, so I thought, all right then, and just put the uh, pot straight into the naturalistic setup, and... After a few weeks, they moved out of their pot and made their own little nest in the kind of main tank area. All right. And would you say you have any tips for the best way to found the species? Just make sure you give them a lot of food, to be honest. I think you just got to keep the food come, like going in and coming out as well. So like, don't leave any food in there for any time at all, because you just want to minimize that mite risk. Yeah. And if you've got access to um, the hypoaspis mites, you can just chuck them in, even if it doesn't look too bad. <laughs> like I do, it never hurts, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, in the naturalistic setup, they may start hunting the springtails, but generally, if it is a mite, it's a species known to get mites often, I would also recommend if you are 
looking out for buying some hypernastic miles, uh, why not dump a little bit in there? Hi, it's Sexy from Pour More Art. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Ant Pod, and please visit my ant and spider shop at www.pouremoreart.ca. We're a Canadian business shipping ant and spider keeping supplies worldwide, specializing in test tube accessories and a variety of hybrid formicaria, glass outrolls, and enclosures. Enjoy the show! Sid, what way have you founded your species and uh, grown them? Uh, well, in that that scenario, the reason that I didn't keep them in a test tube was because of the mites. So, uh, one of the issues with test tubes is if a colony has mites, um, the cotton becomes uh, basically the perfect breeding ground for the mites to lay eggs and reproduce, um, because it just meets all the requirements of you know if the the, the test tube is kept at the temperature obviously for the ants it's kept at the perfect temperature for the the mites to uh, to breed in and then you have that that humidity requirement and um dampness that again is perfect for mites so um it's why i think a lot of people they may receive ants and it's very difficult for stores to quarantine them because of the the long lifespan of um the the eggs um, or the, the cycle of eggs that you can have, you know, a colony of diversa arrive um, and it would look mite free. But, uh, you know, what's happening is there could be, you know, a, a load of mite eggs in the cotton or in the substrate. You know, it's one of the things to really be careful of is if ants ever arrive in a tube with with soil or substrate, if that soil was collected from where they originally came from, there's a there's a very good chance that that will also contain my eggs. So <clears throat> I think it's just a a trait that has you know where they collected from because um, a lot of the larger colonies they're they're wild collected and and, and not sort of raised from queens. Um, and when they're often collected, you know, dirt is scooped up with them as well as um, you know my eggs and stuff that they I'm guessing they're surrounded um, by in the wild um so yeah i the the thought process was just to get them out of a test tube and get them straight into in in a nest in in my logical mind i was thinking that gypsum's a very a very bad breeding ground for um for mites because of the swings in humidity um so i made um i made a point of you know letting the 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 humidity drop down very low to the point where the the gypsum would almost be at a point of nearly drying out uh in which case that would pull any you know any moisture out of um that the the eggs would require in, in the hope of, of maybe killing them whether that worked or not i don't know uh all i know is that you know it, it thankfully um the mites disappeared uh, in those scenarios and um you know, but they they stuck to one corner of the nest in a little chamber, and I guess it was no real difference than 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 just being underground in in a chamber and and just founding away. That was just a clutch of eggs, and and um, you know they had their little waste ground. They're pretty good actually at getting rid of uh, of waste, and and thankfully they weren't putting the waste in the nest. They were actually putting it down the tube, so it made cleaning them out very easy uh, in that scenario. So yeah, but just a little bit of life, you know, just half a mealworm. Um, I think I gave that to them maybe just maybe just under once a week um when they were small and uh, and then just sort of scaled it up and i think when it when they got to around about 100 workers i think i added a an outworld around that point and then then and then from there it just rocketed off all right so hood you've already told a little bit of why you chose to go with an artificial setup um jake why did you choose to go with a naturalistic setup well, it just seemed what everyone had done, to be honest. And I had a massive tank and where well, it just seemed a match made in heaven, to be honest. Although straight after, um, I saw hoods in a, what's it, a kind of, what do you call it, a synthetic setup or not natural setup. And I yeah, did half, like, yeah. regret it a little bit, kind of moving them into it. However... I think long term, like now, it's like no, nah, no. Nah, I think it was all right. <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of just following everyone else, to be honest. Yeah, so of course it is quite a like Hood also mentioned in the beginning, quite a lot of saying you cannot found them in artificial. You need this naturalistic setup. Um, I don't quite know where where this has come from. If it's kind of to deal with the mites 
if it's if that's the reason why they are a lot more successful in a naturalistic setup because mites maybe are harder to find the ants or maybe because the protein and the ants are separated um i'm not too sure but sid why did you choose to go with the artificial setup um well i just don't have the space for um for artificial um you know i love artificial setups but um Natural. yes not yeah sorry <laughs> natural i love that na- i love um i love natural setups i i just suck at making them though you know i can't i'm not like ryan you know i don't have the eye for um for for escaping and and all this cool stuff and um not only that you just generally because of the nature of the the ants that they are um being a swarming species when the, when any of those types of ants tend to grow to big numbers they will just absolutely just decimate any plant life they'll turn over dirt you know it's it's just really difficult to make a really nice so it, it just ends up being a tank of dirt and um you know for me I love to I love to witness and, and study ants. So, you know, it was just not really an option for me. I would rather try and just see if it was possible to um make, you know, make nests work because I want to see all the stuff going on in the nest and and I think that to really study and learn from ants, it's a requirement because natural setups you you just wouldn't see the, you know, a lot of the stuff. I mean, I learned loads from keeping them. You know, it's some of their behaviors, some of their habits, the way that um you know the way in which the the super majors work with you know having multi roles you know it's just really interesting stuff but you would you'll only see that in a, in a nest you wouldn't you wouldn't unfortunately see that in natural setups um and uh you know even the way that they feed you know a lot of it's a lot of it's hidden with that species unfortunately a lot they don't do much above ground apart from just forage and um and they they it's a requirement for them to get food into the nest um they they like i'll touch on that later but yeah it's an absolute requirement for them to take food back to the nest um rather than you know consume it outside so uh yeah just really for a lot of reasons but mostly product testing and things as well um and i think some of the reasons why they may have not previously worked in um in nest is because they they're obviously ground dwelling species and i think it's really important for them to have a, a kind of environment that replicates that and the in the in the ms nest i think they worked well because such a big gypsum block it's it, it very much replicates being underground um through the amount of humidity and, and even through the the fact that it works as a water water um drinking source as well when it's hydrated so uh, i think for those reasons is, is why it may have worked um whereas a lot of other nests you know i don't think i don't think it'd be possible to make acrylic work um you know, I just don't think they'd get the humidity requirements or maybe even just the water sources. I mean, you can give it's very difficult, unfortunately, because of the size of the workers to use um, because they bury everything. So trying to use a, a liquid feeder or something uh, would be just a no go. They would just absolutely bury it under substrate or with debris and things um, because they're, they're, they're one of those kind of types of species where if anything's a hazard, they just bury it. So if you try and put sugar in there, they'll bury it. They'll put liquids anywhere in the outlet, they'll bury it. Um, so yeah, it's. Uh, I think that that might be one of the reasons why not many people used uh, nests and they went out. They went with the natural. Yeah, I will. Oh, sorry. I will, if you don't mind me cutting in and adding something there. Uh, obviously, with mine being artificial setup, uh, I have no. Uh, I do give them extra water in a test tube. Now I make sure there's an air pocket in behind the test tube cotton wool so the, does, the cotton wool doesn't get sucked down into the test tube but they do drink from that they sort um, they do drink it quite quite readily as well so using a test tube right over a liquid feeder is a viable option for them when it comes to water and yet again sid's very right when it, whenever they they have a tendency to bury stuff as well but i've noticed with the jelly pots that they don't they, when they have put debris on top of it they still mine past that debris and still get the uh, sweet jelly stuff for them. So those two methods of water and carbohydrates in, in an artificial setup is is ideal because they both work really well. All right. So I think I think also what what we've also touched a little bit upon is why they don't really do that good in artificial nest in general. It's because the good thing with gypsum is it is such it can create such a high humidity area, and that's what this species really needs. 
And if you have something like an acrylics nest with a sponge system, a sponge needs a lot more hydration and it dries out a lot quicker. And you may need to water it every day to get the same results as a simple gypsum block. And that may be why we also touched about before that you tend to go with a naturalistic setup because everything is just a lot more moist. Now, said you said before that we are going to go into it a little bit later, but I think it's time now to talk about it because the best nest to use them in is this kind of artificial gypsum nest or a naturalistic setup. But what did you do with that prototype um, that went so horribly wrong that the colony died? So what I was trying to do, so at the time I was struggling with space. So what I tried to do was try and find a way I could I could make a kind of uh, it's difficult obviously without displaying it but I tried making like a multi floor nest so that they would have to kind of slalom up some uh, some hole like it was multi leveled and then it had a hole uh, going through the floor you know to above so they'd have to kind of go up these uh, sort of snaking holes and then go across and then snake all the way back down the other side and there were big chambers none of it was hydrated it was all it was a it was a dry sort of kind of more like a maze um but it would just give them a big amount of space that they could use as, as nesting area uh, before they got to the outworld and I, and I sit i sat it between the nests and between the outworld and um you know the the idea was to have it you know it was it was um it was completely it was see through so you could you know it was clear at the, the clear acrylic at the back and the front and you could see into it and it was kind of you know i thought that would that would work really well um but i then um i then later realized um that you know, I, I, I hooked it up and and i gave them their usual feeding and i and i used to feed mine um you know one or two uh, morio worms so the super worms, they absolutely love those. Um, and um, what they did is they they swarmed them in the outworld. And typically, what they used to do is they they would uh, the way diversa work. They uh, are very tremendous in the way in which they work together, and they're very grippy as ants. And they would swarm a, a prey, and they would all kind of create a net amongst themselves. And they grab hold of rocks and debris and substrate, whatever they can. And they will use the surrounding to work as like extra weight to pin the prey down. And if it's a very strong prey, you know, in the in the case of um, superworms being quite strong, they would recruit. They, so they have a couple of workers. So as soon as they engage prey, they're very good at sizing up whether or not this is this is going to be a challenge for them. And typically, the super majors will stay in the nests almost all the time. Um, because they almost because they they do work as repletes. Um, they their their gas to swell and they tend to from from when I had them appear like they are almost containing a yellow liquid. Um, but they 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 kind of you know triple in size from when they're um, when they're sort of born. And um, but when when they have tough prey, the workers will rush into the nest, and you'll see them. It'll be about three or four of them, and they obviously must release some pheromone because as they're running into the nest, it's almost like they're screaming, like "Get out and help!" Because there's just all the workers and all the supers that they pass along the way, and they do a full run all the way into the you know to the deepest part of the chambers in the in the furthest part of the nest, and there will just be this insane swarm, and I mean like the near enough three quarters of the nest within 30 seconds is just emptied out into the outworld and they will just swarm this prey and the supers will be there with their big jaws you know to try and crush you know heads or pin down or whatever it is to try and immobilize the prey but the the workers will swarm that and then what they will do is they'll when the prey is kind of you know either too tired or dispatched or killed or whatever it is they will all work together and lift it into the nests. They'll drag it into the tube and they'll haul it all the way into the inner part of the nest. And then that's when, you know, the supers and the smaller workers will start to eat. Um, and they only do it when they get it into the nest. And um, what I think went wrong with the setup was um, they pulled the prey into the nest, into the very first chamber. Um, but they were unable to then lift this, lift it up to the next level, because in that particular prototype, because the ants could travel up vertically, I didn't really worry about it. But I didn't think that they would have to lift prey up there as well. So they struggled with that. And as a result, they weren't able to get the superworms 
into the nest part. So what they did is they just left them and they, they didn't attempt to eat them. They just left them there. So I'd gave them their usual weekly feeding. And then when I'd come back to check on them, you know, five days, a week later to give them the next feeding, I noticed this tremendous mound and it's like a mountain, a mountain of black. And I'd lost about 90%, maybe 95% of the small workers um in in just that week and i think this was over a summer so it may have been a combination of of the fact that they'd not had their feeding which may have supplied them with some some hydration um and it was time for their hydration at that point anyway but it was just out of nowhere this huge mountain of work has just died off and i thought well okay that that was that went catastrophically wrong i kind of looked saw these the food not taken into the nest and they'd not eaten it they just it just the, the super worms were still there intact. So if they cannot get the food into the nest, they just starve, which is which I found very, very interesting, but it must be a behavioral thing. Um, and, you know, this may or may not be true for everyone. I don't know. Just This is just what happened in my scenario um, that I just I lost so many of the small minor workers. And I thought, well, okay, thankfully I've not lost the entire colony. But what I did, what I was left with was approximately about 150 super majors and about a hundred minor workers and i thought well you know okay all the hope is not lost disconnect took away the, the the problematic prototype connected everything back up like it was like normal and things just carried on going downhill um i fed them they took food in they weren't consuming it like they were before they ate some it started deteriorating and just had a lot of problems from that point and I think what was happening was the super majors were consuming too much of the resources and because the super majors don't really go out and forage. And I think that the problem was that the super majors were just taking up so much of the colony resources that the, the, there was no brood being produced. Things just went really wrong. And eventually the colony just over the course of a couple of months just uh, deteriorated to the point where unfortunately they went down to well i'd lost those original those hundred remaining workers after about a couple more weeks and i was just left with nearly super majors and and that was where i think the problem i should what i should, probably should have done was separate the super majors out of there and leave the hundred workers with just the queen because i think the the that was where it went, went wrong um i lost those minor workers and i was left for a few months with just uh you know three four workers and uh, massive amounts of super majors so yep just one thing to kind of learn from that you know it's it's quite it's critical for them to be able to get um proteins uh directly into the nest yeah and of course this may not be the same for everyone like you also said um but it's definitely worth if you're thinking of getting a vertical nest that this could happen of course if they can drag it into the nest part of the vertical nest it may not happen but it's definitely a good story to have in mind and it's a story um that certainly sets something going in your head um but you talked a lot about these super worms is that what you would recommend people should feed carabara diversa well i fed them originally on the small um mealworms the uh, I gave them all types, really, to be honest. Crickets, superworms. Superworms was just an option. I, I, I found that very interesting to watch them and study them um, with the um, with uh, superworms because of the sheer strength of them. I always found it so impressive to watch them and study how they use the environment to to basically pin down. And you, you know, you, you just kind of you really think about it the size of that superworm to the workers it's almost like it's like if anyone's seen the uh, the avengers when the hulk takes on that massive worm thing at the end of um um yeah. the, the avengers assemble and um you know that's the size comparison and it's it, but it's like a human taking that down but they're all working together and uh, and they manage it and um and yeah so it, it was nice to see the natural um, behavior of them. So for me, a big favorite was the um, the superworms. But the, you need a big colony to start doing that. You know, we, you've got to really be over a thousand workers. Um, but before that, it was mealworms, and then occasionally I'd do the uh, crickets as well. All right, Jake, what is your? Do you have anything you've seen them react better to or not react to at all? Uh, what would you recommend feeding? Well, honestly, they'll eat anything, in my opinion. If it's protein, like 
you could ch- I've chucked in like mice. I've chucked in pretty much every feeder insect that I could get my hands on, and they've eaten everything. Uh, the only issues I've ever had with them is the jelly pots, but I think that's because I've got a naturalistic setup. But they normally go mouldy quite fast, and because they bury them, it happens extra fast because the soil is dirty, kind of thing. But um, yeah, they're literally any sort of protein i've found like steak as well i had pj saying feed your aunt steak so it was yeah and went a load of steak and they devoured that yeah that's cool uh what about you hood have you anything uh, you would recommend feeding yeah i just want a quick question to um antimatter if that's okay um how do you give them their yeah that's all right carbohydrates what what how do you feed them that if they bury the jelly pots and i'm assuming they'll bury the uh, liquid feeders as well um well they i don't um give them the uh jelly pots much but um when i do um i try to keep them upright and it stops them for a little bit burying it however like water i don't give them any really anymore because they just bury it so fast is that then your carbohydrate source the the once in a while jelly pots not really i think most of the time i just give them the odd little squeeze of uh sugar snaps but I don't really think they need much sugar. Uh, I mean, they, they, they don't really care. Like, the entire yeah. lifespan of uh, the entire lifespan of mine, I never gave them a single drop of sugars or carbs or anything. It was just protein. For the seven months, they were just continually growing like mad, and there was there was next to no, you know, dead workers as a result. So carbs is not an essential. You know, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't take it, and it doesn't benefit them, but it's not a requirement whatsoever. You can you can do away with with sugars with Diversa. Right. I guess I guess if you're depending on what your feeder animals eat, there may be some fruit sugar yeah. or they may get a little bit of the carbohydrates from whatever you feed them. But Absolutely. it's definitely worth thinking about. Uh, Hood, what do you feed your and Yes. Sorry, sorry, I did go off on a ma- uh, massive tangent on that one. Uh, uh, no worries, no worries. I, not to ask. <laughs> um I feed mine majority of my feeding's been dubia roaches. Uh I feed them that's what I feed them mostly, but uh, like um, Sid, I have given the Mario worms because you, I do incapacitate my Mario worms to make sure that they can't bite themselves because I cut through their head. But because of their nervous system, they still frail around a lot. And then, like Sid said, I've noticed that when they have got a really active prey still, then the larger... I've not had any of my, any of my super majors come out yet because they just lurk in the nest, as Sid said. Um, but the much larger majors and possibly the smaller groups of super majors do come out and lend their hand. So observing it wise, uh, Mario worms are really good for that. Uh, I've also, like antimatters, I've not filmed it and put it in a video yet, but I have fed them two pinkies twice now, and they absolutely destroy that and leave nothing left behind, taking bones and everything. But I will slightly say something different to what... Sid said about his experimental setup because I have put food in my other outworlds which is connected by a long bit of tubing and they have hollowed out that food and taken it to the nest so not saying what Sid would say was wrong because he's his observations but I have noticed from my observations that they will take the food if they can't get it in the tubings they will hollow it out for example if it's got an exoskeleton like a cricket of uh or a small locust, sorry, I've, I'm looking at now. They've hollowed that out completely and, and obviously fed it to the um, workers in the nest or the larvae in the nest. And I've also, in the most furthest uh, of the four for the outworlds, I've got the honey pot in there as well. Uh, not honey pot, jelly pot in there. And they've excavated all of that and moved it to the nest as well. So they, they will move it. Um, I don't know if, if what happened with SIDS was correlation with food or not, or just a situation that the Conley was going was, through. Was that food cut open? Yeah, the I always because I kill my I always kill. Yeah, food. I mean it, that could have possibly been the difference because because that they may not have been t- able to get into the the actual superworms in my scenario because yeah. they were fully intact. So I, you know, I, I, it was a long time ago and I just put it down to the fact I didn't really delve too deep into it because I just knew that it, it didn't work because they couldn't get them up. It could have been also a combination of maybe the supers couldn't get to it either because of yeah. the fact that so it's either they couldn't get it in to the super majors or the super majors couldn't get it. But I think that they lacked the possibly the ability to break into the exoskeleton 
And that might have been the reason why, because if it had been a pinky, they probably would have been able to just chew through the soft skin and and get it into the nest. You know, it, there's there was a lot of reason, a lot of things, and I'm not it, that's not really too much to pay attention to. I think because it was primarily just the the prototype that was tested. You know, mm. I, I always test things on my own personal colonies to you know to ensure that that I'm not putting anyone's colonies at risk. So that was just you know one of many things that I tested, and it was my my biggest catastrophic fail. Um, and you know, it, there could have been many factors as to why it didn't work. Um, but you know, just that, that was one observation where I just saw that they, for some reason, they just, the, the, the worms were intact. And if they, if they'd cut the worms open, it may not have actually happened. They may have been able to get in and, and do yeah. their thing. So yeah, it just might've been the reason. But this is a good thing about this. So we can all compare how we do things and what we've observed, isn't it? To give people the better idea of uh, what's gone on with us but yeah like i said it was just my observations what i've seen with my conleys and I, i've noticed they do transport food into the nest um but like sid said i'm looking at them now because i fed them a, a dubia roach a bit ago and they've already moved a small one of the two towards the tube in trying to get it through and they also did the same with the pinkies as well uh i didn't actually see them completely move it through the tube in, but they definitely move it to the area because i do want to pull it into the nest but they 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 will um, they will uh, cut it down to small pieces and transport it like any other ant would as well. But yeah, they, that's how I feed mine. Uh, they seem to, like I said, you can see from my, my YouTube videos that the my is doing really well. So um, yeah, but as uh, Antimat said, that I think they'll pretty much eat anything they get the mitts on. To be honest. <laughs> All right. So. The next topic is a little bit hard because I've, as far as I can feel like uh, Sid, you've just upgraded adding more nest. Hood, you've just upgraded adding more nest. And Jake, you've literally just moved the colony itself. And um, the question is how to move the colony. Um, and due to none of you actually, as far as I'm aware, have actually moved the colony by letting the ants go from one nest to another. I would say this is a matter of uh, the species like heat. And if you live at least in you, if you live outside where they're native and you have a colder room, I'll recommend that you heat up the new nest and that way the colony can move towards the heat because heat is generally move towards the heat if they are in a colder area. I don't know if you guys have any tips on how to move them or we should just uh, go on. Well, I would say hydration, just, just you can control oh, yeah. most ants you can control using uh, humidity. So, um, for example, like if I not that I need to, I mean, I think in in diverse's case, planning is very important when you can you keep, if you're planning on having this colony, you need to you have to really think ahead as to you know what how you're going to found them, what nest you're going to move them into, because the 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 type of setup you use has to be really future proofed because these will blow up in in less than a year. They will go from you know really nice manageable test tube size, and then they will be you know 50,000 workers possibly if they're well cared for in in the space of a year so and and that is problematic because that's they they when they're at a stage like that that's where they become almost unmovable um you need to you know if you're in a natural setup you try you know I don't even know how you how I'd begin to move 50,000 workers into a I guess it's just a case of a bigger tank and somehow dig up the dirt and hope you don't damage the queen because it's really difficult to uh, to do that type of stuff, and I mean, artificial it, it makes it easier because you can just connect more nests, so it's it's not the end of the world. But moving them, if you if they're smaller, sort of when they're like five hundred workers, and you need to move them, then you just stop hydrating one nest, and you hydrate the other, and they'll relocate. That's a pretty pretty straightforward way of moving them. Yeah, it's a good thing with having a species that both require heat and humidity. It makes everything a little bit easier compared to stubborn ants like Niger's who can just uh, stay home. Hood, you unmuted, unmuted anything you want to add? Yeah, um, I didn't find them too difficult to move uh, when I wanted them out of the test tube, but I think it's also worth bearing in mind they're quite a mobile species as well. So in na in the natural world, they do move nests quite quite a fair bit, be it for food requirements or what. So. They're, they're not the hardest to move ever when it comes to moving them. But I think if memory serves, I just used light because they're in my room, which is heat at 25 degrees. I don't apply any extra heat to them. 
So I just made sure the nest was hydrated, as, as Sid alluded to, and just put light directly on the test tube. And then they moved. So uh, I think they moved fairly quickly as well. So it wasn't a major drama for me. Right. Well, I feel like we need to ask you, Jake, do you have any plans for them moving in the future? Or are you just expecting them to this to be their forever home? Well, I've kind of got a plan for that. But basically, I'm going to drill in. I've got the 24 millimeter drill bit and I'm just going to drill into the tank and basically pipe it off to another whole tank. And when they want to, they'll be able to kind of move house basically whenever they like. And eventually I'd like to have like three setups and yeah, see what happens. And yeah, they can kind of hop between them though. And yeah. yeah. Can I uh, ask you a quick question, please, uh, matey? Do you know when you moved them in the naturalistic, because you had that triangular small setup, when you put them in the large tank, did you disturb it, put it on its side or anything like that, or did you just plonk it in and, and they moved to their own accord? I literally just plonked it in and let them do it themselves. Yeah. That's smart. But also, I just forget, remembered that Rich um, or Ant Antex that they actually had a similar setup um they had a naturalistic setup and what they did was they put a lid on it and they drilled a hole and they kind of made this um tank go from a naturalistic tank to just being a big nest um we are getting towards the end i don't think i don't know if there's any specific thing you want to add but are there any things you would recommend to do or not do jake well i guess we're gonna have to hit on the point that I think you can add new queens into your colony. So oh, yeah. because the queens only last two years, kind of, well, two or three years if you're lucky, you kind of got to think about, do you want to keep the colony going past that point? And if you do, you've got to start trying to introduce new queens. And I'm guessing if they fly in April, I'm guessing that's about the time of year that you want to be maybe trying to introduce a new queen. However, I'm not sure on the specifics. Not, not at all. No, it's under the, the research and uh, research a little bit extra. But yes, I've also heard that you can add multiple queens together um, well, even later on. I am looking at doing that potentially, if not next season, possibly the season after. Uh, because the queens I've heard lived for about three to five years. So um, at the two-year point of this Conley, I am looking at adding a new queen, so that might be something to watch out for in the future because I've been told they will accept uh, a Conley. So what we normally get is a, is a queen with a small Conley. I'm hoping to attach that and see if they will merge. So wait and see, but I've heard it's possible. All right. Uh, sit or put, do you have anything to add with the do's and the don'ts? Um... Do you want to go first, Sid? Uh, rock away, rock away. I'll, I'll, I'll see what you've got to say, and then I'll add if there's anything. Do prepare for these guys. They, like we've said before, they are difficult to found. I think just about everybody here has failed uh, when they've tried to found them originally, be it mites or whatever. Um, if you do get mites, don't be disheartened. Just make sure that you, you quarantine them appropriately. Wash all your utensils and stuff, and hope they pull through. But it's very common with these ants, so don't let that dishearten you like I did me, because it took me a while to get them again. But be prepared for them. They grow very quick, so don't underestimate their growth rate. Mine stayed growing at a fairly steady pace for quite a while, and then miraculously overnight, they massively expanded, and I didn't have a nest ready for them, so I had to get another one in. Uh, I've now got a nest on standby for them ready for when they need it because already i don't know when i did my last video a couple of three two to three weeks ago uh i can already see now that their brood has grown even more which means they're going to be once they hatch and they replace those brood with more brood that i'm going to need another nest so be prepared for quick expansion and don't underestimate them all right Zip. um so like Hood said, the founding is the hardest stage um, by far. I mean, with, with most ants it is, but especially in the case of Diversa. Um, the the things to bear in mind are their actual requirements with regards to temperature and humidity are pretty straightforward. They're not extreme, so they're, they're actually quite... They're really easy to keep when they get going. Um, 
and don't be disheartened if they if you don't don't succeed the first time round. Um, you know, maybe try something a bit different. But sometimes it is just down to the the health of the queen plays a massive part. Remember that vast majority of colonies are wild caught, and uh, as a result of that. There's there's all types of different parameters. You know, it's stores try their hardest to supply healthy queens. There's a limitation of obviously what they can do. Um, you know, just just try and look for you know good reputable suppliers. That you know, as an example, I know that um, Ant Antics has um, really beefed up the quarantine process on um things like diversa he when i spoke to him last you know he's doing pre-treatments of hypoestis miles so you know it's it's not a it's not an uncommon thing to get mites in them um it's just you know it's it's unfortunately one of the downsides to that species in general um but uh you know just trying to minimize that that risk when you're initially getting them um and 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 hope for the best when it founds but if you get them founded after that, they're an incredibly rewarding species to keep um, for ant keepers. They're very challenging, but I'm sure if you speak to Hood, he will, you know, rate them very, very highly. Uh, I definitely want to keep them again, absolutely. And um, you know, I, I I really miss them for for a lot of reasons, and I would definitely rate them as one of my top five all time species to keep. Um, just because they're just so interesting, there's always something to observe. They're really, really active. The growth rate, you know, they're but like Hood said, a lot of preparation is required. And if you are going um, down a nest route, you know, you, you do have to be prepared that they are not a cheap colony to house. Um, I mean, it may change in you know going forward depending on what what stuff's around. Um, but yeah you know that but they're definitely definitely worth the um worth a lot of the hassle that you can have in the early stages but don't be disheartened um you know they i think i think you'll probably notice that a lot more people going forward will start keeping them and and hopefully that will help with the knowledge of the species in in the hobby and there'll be a lot more advice and things to do but you know that, that i think this is the the nice thing with these types of care guides is they're not like classic care guides which is just all you know just kind of very basic info this is uh, you know hopefully touches on some of the do's and don'ts and what worked and what didn't work so uh it's a nice sort of foundation for for, for what people should expect right well i feel like we have touched upon the final question being any struggles with this species we have touched upon foundation uh founding the colony we've touched upon mites how they maybe can track a lot of dirt onto their food and all of this but is there any things we have not at all talked about or are you satisfied with the struggling of keeping the species i think i think we've pretty much touched most things oh, yeah i, I do have one thing to add like just one thing that stands out from all the other ants if you put food that kind of off the floor kind of on a raised platform or anything like that they will not touch it like they will literally just ignore it for days and days. Even if it's like cockroaches, they don't care. They just don't pick it up. Like they just will not climb. You're going to hate me because <laughs> 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 I seem to be contradicting everybody today. Um, mine, I have got uh, the, the main feeding uh, area that I use is the Wakushi S5 nest. It's got the pillars up the side where you can attach platforms to feed them. I've put cockroaches on there and I've put um, honey pots in them as well. And they do, because I like the trails. I love the trails. I think they're awesome. Um, and these are very trailly ants. Um, but yeah, they, they do, for me, they do climb platforms and stuff to get to the food. Not to say that you're wrong. I'm just saying from my experiences. I think which, I've seen it on my videos as well, if you check it out. Yeah, which platform it did you use, Antimatters? I was just using one of mine, but it could have been because of the uh, space they've got. If you get what I mean, yeah, possibly, but, uh, yeah. But I, yeah. I ended up having to take the like dubia roaches, put them on the floor, kind of annoy all the ants, yeah. get a few of them hitched onto it, and then I'd put it back up there. And then mm. they do a trail, but until then they were like, "No, we don't really want to inspect up here." So do they not walk up the pillar uh, up the um the trays at all? Some of like them just... did, yeah, but they'd go up and they'd just be like, mm. 
and then walk back down. And it's just like, what are you yeah. up to? Like, it was I like mean, it wasn't their territory or something, if you get what I mean. Yeah. I mean, it's something to bear in mind. I think in Hood's case, I think it obviously some do, but it just might be bearing in mind that they, I mean, it, it may have been another they reason. Yeah. I mean, because I had the issue where mine died out because obviously they couldn't lift them. Well, it could be because of the weight in that scenario. Um, they did try, but I just don't think they could through the weight. But either way, you know. And they don't climb the plants either. Like, they, I think, they will not climb my little plants. I think all three of us would probably say that we, despite the challenges of them, I don't think we would change keeping them at all. I think they are entirely worth, absolutely worth the, the, the challenges that, it, that they kind of bring along with keeping them. No, I totally agree. Um, I, I was just thinking about it when you said it before. Um, out of all my colonies, I think they're the. If I had to get rid of all my colonies, going to keep one, I think they'll be the ones that I keep because they've just got because they're so polymorphic. Um, meaning that workers of different sizes. For those who didn't know the terminology, um, they're just so interesting. Um, the way that they swarm the prey, the way the way they form the trails, they're great to look at. They're great to watch, and I absolutely love the super majors they're just so beautiful and because i've got them in this artificial setup i can see the super majors in the nests and see exactly what they're doing um and they're absolutely gorgeous um definitely and the way the little them. ones ride along like oh, the, yeah uh, ride, the is, like, ride on back, on the back which is like something special for them I, I think they're a really really good alternative to anyone who's got a, a real itch for something like geminata because i think they're a really good replacement for hood's geminata um, you know, for people who want really fast, insanely fast growing species that have that crazy swarming capability. Um, but in some ways, obviously, you know, they have the added advantage of super majors, which are, you know, they're, they're like absolute ogres. And it is funny when, like Antimatter said, they come charging like, and the little workers are trolling on the back of them, riding them like beasts. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really, really cool species. It's like seeing out the Lord of the Rings and the Volivons. <laughs> it, it, it exactly yeah. is. I just I always imagine them like when in Lord of the Rings, when when that ogre comes bashing through the door, and there's just all the little the little trolls riding on the, on the shoulders, and that's it. And, and it is. They're really they're quite dumb. They the way that they they very clumsily move around, and the way that they find prey. It's almost just like they just don't know what they're doing, and they rely on the little workers to guide them. They just smash. All right. Well, I think this has been a lovely care guide. Um, this has been a care guide about Carabara Diversa. Now, once again, I want to say thank you for the... Oh, I want to say thank you to all the hosts for joining. We had once more Anne's Hood, Sid from Makushi, and Jake from Ansi Matters. Now, all of the links to all of the hosts can be found in the description for all interested. And I want to say thank you for listening in. The Anpad releases new episodes every Wednesday and care guides every few weeks. If there's a species you want to hear about, send us a message to the Anpad Instagram. And with that, you will hear more from us at the Anpad next week. <laughs>